Uh, almost four and one. This is uh, for the vice mayor. I have my okay. four year old bringing son over for lunch today. So, uh, Mayor, uh, members of council, uh, all those in attendance, uh, today we're going to move into our sophomore uh, discussion on the comprehensive sea level rise and recurrent flooding study that Dewberry has uh, continues to uh, perform for us. Uh, you have had your first briefing uh, several months ago, and now we promised we'd be back to you with a series of updates. And so today, uh, we have our lead engineer for our Stonewater Center of Excellence, uh, C.J. Bodner, to join us today with, uh, with his complete engineering direct, uh, Department of Public Works engineering team in, in tow. And uh, I know this is a rather thorough, a rather heavy document, and yes, there is some uh, a step back so that uh, you get to uh, re-establish your knowledge, uh, your, your baseline data with regards to what this stormwater uh, study, a uh, $4 million study of which NOAA provided us $800,000 to perform. But uh, what you will get now is a more refined look at uh, one of the areas that they have completed their analysis on. Uh, and we still have one uh, complete area yet to come. That will be our junior level of discussion uh, as we go through this process of educating ourselves on what sea level rise is and ultimately leading to some very serious discussion on, uh, uh, on uh, solutions. So with that as an intro, I'm going to let CJ roll with this. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, with me today is, is Mark uh, Johnson, the Director of Public Works, uh, Phil Pullen, the City Engineer, uh, Tony Alger, who is the Administrator for the Stormwater uh, Engineering Center, and Sue Kriebel, who is actually the Project Manager for this project. To go over a quick little agenda for you, we're going to cover some structural uh, alternative measures. We're going to talk about individual site parcels, uh, nature-based, which is also called green solutions, uh, public engagement, and we're going to go talk about the next steps and then the policy document. In regards to the citywide structural alternatives, to remind you from back in January, we're doing this on three levels. We're doing the citywide level, which would protect everyone against a 100-year storm FEMA-certified design, so that would allow for insurance rates to be able to be reduced. We're also doing a neighborhood level to be able to look at 10 and 50-year storms for certain neighborhoods uh, that may need something in the interim before the structural citywide structural alternatives go in place. And we're also looking at site solutions for individual parcels. So since January, we've gone and uh, refined all of our alignments, refined our costs, updated the benefit cost analysis, uh, finalized the hazards analysis for determining what the, the flood risks are. Uh, and we completed the site and structure renderings and the draft report. So to go back a little bit and give you all the new numbers with the alignments we looked at back in January, uh, alignment A1 would be within the city only. This is the minimum protection level that we've an analyzed. So we're looking at just doing something along the Chesapeake Bay. A1 would be just within the city of Virginia Beach. It has a price tag of $1.13 billion. Uh, A2 would be coordinating with Norfolk and doing something across the entire Chesapeake Bay to include Little Creek and uh, also Norfolk. And it has a price tag of about $2.31 billion. When you see the costs for anything that involves cooperation with another municipality or another uh, entity like the Navy bases, uh, those costs are Virginia Beach's portion of those costs. That does not include, that's not the total cost of the project. When you see number of houses protected and floodplain area reduced, that is only within the city of Virginia Beach. We don't have the information for Norfolk, for the military base or Chesapeake to be able to make those determinations of what additional benefits there may be in other municipalities. The second level of protection we looked at is the uh, what we call the increased protection level. And the difference here is, is we protect the entire city. We protect up at the Lynn Haven. We protect along the Atlantic Ocean, down in Sandbridge and Muddy Creek, along West Neck Road. Uh, the difference between the two is what we do at the Lynn Haven, whether you put something along the Lesnar <coughs> Bridge in the Chesapeake Bay, or do you go up into each one of the branches of the Lynn Haven River. Uh, as you can tell, going up in the branches raises the cost. It goes from two point, uh, 2.22 billion to 2.77 billion dollars uh, protects actually by going up in the bay you actually protect less structures because there is no protection for the west part of the Lesnar Bridge uh, uh, part of the city 
Uh, and it also reduces, <laughs> it's got a, actually less protection in the way of floodplain reduction. But we looked at this because we wanted to make sure we didn't leave any stone unturned. We wanted to make sure that we looked at every possible solution. The final s set of solutions is called the maximum protection. This adds putting something on the Elizabeth River out near the Ford plant between Chesapeake and Norfolk. So it would involve coordination with the city of Norfolk and the city of Chesapeake to have that built. Um, and it has a price tag for, again, the difference between C1 and C2 is what you do at the Lesnar, uh, the Lesnar Bridge. The price tag for doing C1 is $2.42 billion, protects about 45,000 homes and reduces about 85 square miles of floodplain. Uh, as part of our additional analysis we've done, we've done a benefit cost ratio because if for every dollar you spend, you want to get at least a dollar of benefit. Uh, the benefits in this case would be avoided damages, what the reduction in the amount of flooding that would occur, the amount of damages that would occur when a flood, when a flood happens. And because we're looking at benefits that are 50, 60 years in the future, we use the Office of Management and Budgets uh, standard for bringing those values back, what their discount rate and what their present values are, to make sure everything is being compared in 2018 dollars. So we come to our chart updated. The green means is the, the darker the green, the bigger the benefit, the lighter the yellow, the lesser of the value it is in the chart. Uh, but what we want to direct your attention to is the construction cost numbers ranging between 1.13 and 2.97 billion dollars. Again, remember the ones with the asterisks involve cooperation with other municipalities, so those are just the Virginia Beach costs. Those do not include the total cost of the project. And we look at the benefit cost ratios and see they range from 1.01 to 2.01, uh, which means they all have a higher benefit than they would have costs. This is the chart we showed you back in, in January. Uh, we're $12 million a year now in annual flood losses in the city of Virginia Beach, $271 million when you go to three foot of sea level rise. Now that we've completed all the hazardous analysis, completed all the benefits analysis, those numbers have changed. They are now $26 million a year in flooding damages to the city of Virginia Beach every year. And with three foot of sea level rise, if we do nothing, it goes to $329 million a year in flooding losses. That's without doing anything. But when we implement the benefits by putting in the citywide strategies, those numbers drop to between $33 million for a year for uh, alternate alignment C1 and it goes up to $164 million a year for alignment A1. Uh, always get asked, what is this going to look like? So we put, wanted to make sure we put pictures in there. We had WPL and Dewberry Prepare renderings. So this is the Lynn Haven uh, Inlet, the Lesnar Bridge. And what we would do is we'd look to build some type of sand dune and sheet pile reinforcement along the beaches with a flood wall that would connect to a in-water movable gate in the non-navigable portion of the channel. And you would have some type of horizontal sector gate in the navigable portion so you'd be able to allow ship traffic to continue forward. Mm. Looking at the ocean front, uh, specifically we're at the boardwalk at 20th Street. Uh, you've got your rail and the rail in the future would have to become a seawall. And you would provide some type of sliding floodgate. So if we had a storm coming, you would be able to slide the gates in place to keep the water uh, out so that you do not have flooding occurring at the ocean front. At Rudy Inlet, you would have a horizontal sector gate again because it's a navigable channel. That sector gate would tie to some type of sh uh, sand dune and sheet pile reinforcement along Croatan and would tie in up to the improvements along the ocean front at the seawall. Sandbridge, this portion of Sandbridge between the ocean and, and Back Bay has a bunch of canals and, and uh, waterways in there to allow the people to have boat access to Back Bay. What we would have to do is provide gates along those to, so they would still have access to Back Bay and build a seawall. And that seawall wouldn't actually be built on people's property. It would be built a little bit into the water because in order to build that, you have to provide some type of structural foundation behind the wall to make sure it's not going to overtop during a storm event. On Muddy Creek Road, and this is just an example of one of the things that could be done in the Southern Rivers. This could be done at Muddy Creek. It could be done on, along Nanny's Creek Road uh, and any other area where water would come from Back Bay up into the parcels uh, to the west of Back Bay. And you would have to raise the bridge, put in some type of miter gate, provide a levee, building basically a levee with, and one thing that's not shown on the drawing is the, this little building right here is actually the pump house in a gatehouse, so it would actually allow you to put pumps in. So when you have a storm event, you can pump the water from the upstream side of the gate to the downstream side of the gate so that you don't cause flooding by having a storm event that occurs. The final rendering that I'm going to show you is West Neck Road, uh, crossing over West Neck Creek. Again, raise the road to create a levee, put gates in 
that would be able to um, allow the passage of water up and down the creek. In normal situations, these gates would be open. You have your gatehouse and pump station to be able to pump the water as we move forward. Um, again, citywide structural alternatives is what I just went over. The neighborhood strategies, we're still finishing. We have about 45, 60 days worth of uh, time that we still need to be able to finish those. So we didn't want to present you something that wasn't finalized. So I'm going to move forward to the site parcel and individual site strategies. I'm sorry, Ms. Evan, I see your hand. I'm sorry. Okay. I, was <laughs> anyway, I had a question because I noticed you showed most of the, well, it looks like all of them, but the, what the Elizabeth River would look like. We have one of those. I, I can, I can okay. send that out to council. I'm sorry I didn't include that uh, because that is more of a regional. That would be a combination with Chesapeake and Norfolk. Uh, that would be something that would probably be built as part of an Army Corps of Engineers project. Okay. I, w I mean, I'd, whether it's a later brief or not, I yes, would like to know because, I mean, there's a considerable amount of residential over there. And yes, ma'am. We have repetitive lost properties along the river. And, you know, we, I mean, we're on Thursday where we got land that was a house and is now going to be a park. So, I, you know, okay. I, I think it's a definitely a point of interest, uh, especially considering how many, how many structures we have there that are residential. Yes, ma'am. Not you. a problem at all. Yes. Okay. Aaron. Um, the Lynn Haven Inlet back on A1, A2. Yes, sir. <clears throat> if we uh, decide they only to do just the Lynn Haven Inlet. Okay, sorry. Yeah, you don't have I to go all the way back. Yeah, you don't have to go all the way back. But uh, my question is, does this... Uh, does it really solve the problem on our side if we just put a wall up on Lynn Haven, um, the inlet right there? Does it push it or make that worse along Little Creek on the other side if we don't complete it the whole way? There is the potential, but if you notice, there's a little branch on the part for A1 that comes down along Northampton Boulevard. Mm -hmm. uh, that would prevent the water from Little Creek being able to get back up into that area. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Anybody else at this point? Okay. Uh, for individual site parcel level strategies, what we wanted to look at here is which sites would be able to be <coughs> mitigated in the future if you just wanted to look at doing something at each individual building. Uh, we, we also looked at can these be used to complement the large citywide structural adaptation strategies. And one good part about this is would it allow you to be able to phase this in implementation? So could you do some of these site mitigation strategies before you got to doing the big heavy lifting with the citywide strategies? When we evaluated these, we evaluated these using three foot of sea level rise in a 500-year storm. We evaluate, evaluated them using FEMA standard analysis, which is the same analysis you would do to be able to acquire mitigation bonds or hazard uh, mitigation funds or hazard grants to be able to, to help pay for these functions. Um, what these <coughs> strategies we're talking about are for residential, you would elevate the house. You take the house, you pull the house up, you build additional foundation underneath it so that the house is at a higher elevation so it's above the design finish <laughs> elevation. We could also look at a demolition and rebuild. This is actually was done in the Princess Anne Plaza area on Northgate. The original house got struck by lightning, caught fire, then flooded during Matthew. And the person who bought the house, this lot, actually built the finished floor up about four feet higher in order to be able to provide flood, flood, flood relief for the lot in the future. The last option for volunteer would be voluntary acquisitions. That would be someone selling their property to the city. We would go in, remove all the improvements from it, return it to a natural state, which provides environmental benefits in addition to reducing flood loss. From a non-residential standpoint, you would look at wet flood proofing, which would be putting foundation vents in, that <coughs> flood vents into the foundation of the building, and taking your critical infrastructure, HVAC units, your electrical meters, and elevating them high enough so that they, don't, they wouldn't become flooded during a, situ, uh, during a storm event. And also dry flood proofing, which would be taking, taking some type of gate and putting it into the openings to be able to keep the water from being able to get into the building. These non-residential could be used for residential, but they're not quantified by FEMA as a way that you could get grant money. So we didn't actually look at the flood proofing options regarding uh, individual residential buildings. Jess. Question on one of the slides that's in, I guess, probably the earlier version of this presentation. What? How do we quantify how much voluntary acquisition we would have to have to see any kind of uh, substantial flood improvement in the surrounding areas? Uh, we actually, um, where's Laura? I want to make sure I get this well, correct let me, here. Let me jump on that. Uh, we use the severe repetitive loss program. Mm -hmm. We pursue FEMA grant money for that. Um, your cost-benefit ratio plays into it. 
they they have done it several ways and we're like in our fourth version we're actually having some some immediate success with elevating houses they've established a hundred and seventy five thousand dollar limit with regards to being able to engineer and do the construction to raise it and so there's there's a a limit uh, by which that happens. Now the homeowners are allowed to come in and offset the costs of that and bear the additional costs associated. Well, I'm talking about voluntary acquisition where we make the land vacant. How do so, we quantify how many square feet we need of vacant land to make a, mm, mm, a, enough of an impact on the surrounding area? Can we measure that? that? Of course we can measure it, but we're looking at into the Windsor Woods area. We're looking at uh, cul-de-sacs that have been habitually going underground, costs associated with potentially buying certain houses to expand BMPs so that you have containment and you're uh, able to uh, add capacity to the stormwater systems. The actual decisions with regards to what that criteria is going to be to acquire those is a policy that we will present to the City Council for moving forward that way. To date, we have not acquired any properties in Virginia Beach right. for this purpose. I have uh, just a follow-up question to that. So when, we, when it does come to policy time for us as far as <coughs> potentially acquiring property voluntarily, will we be able to see that if we qu acquire property A and run it through a simulation, um, I mean, I know that my industry has that simulation software, and I... I'm trying. I think that's what we're trying to build here. If we were to vacate property A and make it just empty space, we could could we see what that would do? So we can then say we're for X amount of dollars, we're able to create this much impact with a Cat Three or whatever. CJ is the lead modeler, so let's ask him. We we would able be able to go in if you were acquiring individual parcels. We could change in the model what the impervious percentage is in that subcatchment and be able to see what the actual impacts would be. Okay. Um, if you were talking one house in a in a ten acre sub in a ten acre subcatchment, probably doesn't have that much of an impact. Sure. But if you're talking acquiring twenty or thirty houses in a in a five acre subcatchment, that probably has a, a pretty good impact. All I'm driving at is I want to I wanted to make sure that we could say with some definitively that well I know we can't say a hundred percent but we could we could create some kind of document that said we acquire this group of properties we can see this effect. Yes ma'am that, that is part of the future feasibility analysis that we'll be doing. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Wood. Well yeah I just wanted to follow up on that. I think it's also whether or not you can create a structure there or some sort of stormwater feature on that property as well because clearly if it's seated or situated in the right place that that you could put in a retention pond or a pump or something like that. That yes, sir. That is part of what we're planning out. With more this. valuable than just being, you know, additional open space. But but this is also very similar to some of the stuff that Ms. Henley was talking about, just just for the council's perspective, with regard to using open <coughs> space for for um, for flooding and sea level rise. And 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 I like the fact that, that that the potential is there to expand it beyond that to willing sellers who who are interested in. In, in selling structures so that we could create open space that would be beneficial to. Yes, sir. Um, what we did is we looked at every single building within the city is how we evaluated this. We looked at which ones would have at least a benefit cost ratio of doing the mitigation strategy of at least 1.0. Because again, you don't want to spend more dollars than what you would get benefits for. And what we found is that citywide, there's about 5,500 structures that you could elevate two feet and be able to do the mitigation and get a benefit cost ratio of greater than one. From a voluntary, and it goes all the way down to the number for voluntary acquisitions, about 2,500 parcels and buildings throughout the city. And this is throughout the city, and this is without implementing any citywide structural strategies. It's just looking at the parcels as they are on the ground right now. From a commercial standpoint, it's between 200 and 400 buildings uh, that you could look to do some type of uh, flood proofing with. <coughs> From a BCR standpoint, you can see all of them have benefit cost ratios over one, but you can notice the voluntary acquisition jumps really high. It jumps to a 5.4. The reason it jumps that high is because the 5.4 accounts for the fact you have no future flood risk with that parcel because there's no more improvements on that site. You don't have a, a, a building that's going to flood in the future, plus the a, uh, Army Corps of Engineers of FEMA lets you account for environmental benefits for the fact you took away impervious and you added uh, grass area to be able to absorb some more of the rainwater. So that's why the BCR for voluntary acquisition jumps as high as it does. John, thank you. Could you 
later as a backup slide, just show us the actual algorithm and then show an example so we can actually see what is the formula being used in both for the benefit and the cost, and then take an actual concrete example and then show how the equation works. So I'm like the, the Missouri the show me state, so I'd like to see how the mechanics work versus just the results. Yes, sir. Dewberry yeah. has all that data, and, and Laura Moss is here with me from Dewberry. Well, She's mentioned stuff in the report, but I don't remember seeing reading the report. <coughs> you said you did some updating of factors and data when you did this presentation. Is yes, that sir. Not correct. I just like to see that updated information. Not a problem, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so, where are these improve? Where are these strategies would be uh, beneficial? And this is for the non-residentials and what I'm going to show you first. And, and the legend for both the residential and non-residential is the same. Where you see a red dot, that means it has a benefit cost ratio between one and two. Where you see a yellow, it's between two and three. The light blue is between three and four. And the dark blue is over four for a benefit cost ratio. So you can see where all the commercial properties were dry flood proofing or wet flood proofing would be an option as a mitigation strategy. And then from a residential strategy, you have your which ones are eligible for elevation and which ones are eligible for demolition rebuild, which ones would have to be voluntary acquisition. But calculating on a site level, knowing that we have citywide strategies coming forward, we want to look what happens when you combine the citywide strategies with this data. And what we find for the elevation is when you put, and this is alignment C1, when you put the, the citywide protections in, all of this area is now protected. So it doesn't need to be elevated now. So really now you're down to a few parcels that would have to be elevated. So, so just yes, pause, sir. CJ. Yes, sir. I need this to sink in because um, this is the, this is the, this is where the synergy of the exterior defense for our city against sea level rise has compounding impacts on what precipitation and storms do internal to the city. So if you look at the left, slowly, CJ, you look at the various uh, BCRs, and of course, blue is the highest ratio, and you can see them scattered. You can see Windsor Woods, you can see Ocean Lakes, you can see the Central Resort area, you can see uh, up uh, around the Shore Drive area on both sides, uh, Ocean Park, Ocean, <coughs> Ocean View, and um, Cape Henry. And when you put in the big muscle moves, which are are not part of our 15-year plan right now. We're still working the drainage areas internal to what precipitation will do in there. You have you remove some of the uh, a great many of the hazards that uh, are affected by tidal flooding that come through those receiving inlets, those receiving waters inlets that in a high tide or stacking tide scenario work in reverse and push waters into the inner part of the city. You can see the barrier system here in the southern watershed. You can see by creating that how many parcels that are designated over here on the, on the before a, 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 a corrective <coughs> action uh, are currently impacted and the, the BC ratio it would that could be created by removing, by removing all those residences, taking them off the map, and this way you can now see that by creating a larger structure, you create safety for those people. This, this is actually the elevation of the buildings. I've got another slide coming up with the voluntary acquisition. John? I'd like to follow up on Mr. Hansen's point because this is accommodating three feet of sea level rise and what level of storm surge or tidal surge on top of that three feet of sea level rise does this accommodate? The 500-year storm. Which is how many feet of tidal surge? Uh, don't, uh, I don't want to say it. I know 25 is 6. The 100 is 8.4, so you're probably looking around 9.9. Nine. Because the 500-year things from FEMA are usually based on rainfall, not hurricanes. Yes, sir. That's part of the reason why there's a difference between the FEMA map in North Carolina and it's FEMA Region 3 is the one who doesn't include the hurricanes. So if we took, for example, because it's an actual experience and we had data, and took, I think, Hurricane Donna in 61, and I think uh, the Northeaster was 63, 62, I forget which it was. So if we took the last 
head-on that actually landed here, Category 2, that's back in the early 60s, might have even been 1960. And then the Northeaster, which we often talk about, the big storm of the water was just below the street blades at the ocean front. You probably see the picture. That's Wednesday. Wednesday. That's Wednesday. And ran those numbers, those known numbers, what would that picture look like? And would this particular fence, as it was described of, would it repel that at three feet, or would there still be collateral damage and overwash? I'm just trying to get an idea as what for the three, for the ultimate, the three billion. So people know what often was mentioned, are we getting protection against rain? And how much? I think that's always it. Or are we getting protection against, but we're not telling people that if we get hit by a head-on hurricane too, we're not promising people that they're not going to flood. I just want, I'm just trying to set the expectations of what you get. And I think those would be two good benchmarks to look and to test what we get. And as we move from our sophomore briefing to our junior briefing to our senior reason, briefing, that's the fidelity we will present to you. And, and as all engineers do, they do clarify the limits of what engineering will provide and the costs associated with stretching that limit to the max. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. So similar to the other slide which showed elevation, this shows the demolition rebuild, where existing demolition rebuild, if you didn't do any city protections, would be. And this shows you where we would need to do demolition and rebuilds if you were to uh, implement the citywide strategies. And then finally, voluntary acquisition. You can see the voluntary acquisition parcels currently without any citywide strategies and which parcels we would be looking at for voluntary acquisition moving into the future. And so just, just pause, just pause, because <clears throat> the, the conversation in play right here is sea level rise. It is not storm water. It's not precipitation. It's not a Matthew kind of storm that came to us, did not have really significant tidal impacts other than restricting the outflow of water based on the elevations in the Lynn Haven or in Rudy at the time that the, the rain fell. This is, this is to combat the from out to in push of sea level, either from the Atlantic, down from the Chesapeake into the Lynn Haven, or the Chesapeake into the James and the Elizabeth, or through the Oregon Inlet into the Albemarle, Currituck, and up into Back Bay. It is not. It is not putting into effect. Yes or no. Yes, sir. Water. So if if you had that push, and and we'll we'll bring you this modeling because we can do that. But if you put 13 inches of rain in 13 hours, like you saw at Matthew, this picture looks a whole lot more demonstrative <laughs> because you have to put in place that. $1.3 billion, 15-year recurrent flooding scenario, all those projects that we've laid out for you to, to defeat the precipitation inside and be able to cast it over these barriers through pump systems into the receiving waters that are being held out from the tidal surge. So just understand, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about sea level rise and the big muscle moves <coughs> so that your work inside the center of the city, the capture, the burn pond and pump concepts that we have in the inner heartland of our city are able to work as you cast them over the barriers that the sea level is uh, rise is trying to penetrate. Thank you. Rosemary, and then John. What time frame are we, talk are we talking about on this? We're, we are designing for sea a three foot of sea level rise to be occur between the years 2065 and 2085. That is also what HRPDC voted unanimously uh, back in November to set as the standard. It's also been confirmed by uh, Dr. Boone at VIMS that that's the path that is based off the Sewell's Point gauge. John. Okay, I just want to make sure. Uh, when you were looking at the benefit piece, and I don't know to what extent, because a lot of these commercial stuff, you have to go out to the commercial market, these higher, more expensive buildings to secure private flood insurance. So I don't know when we were doing our analysis of benefits, if we engaged, you know, the bigger banks, the bigger insurance companies and said, because <coughs> they're already modeling this stuff, I can assure you. And so 
and it's more of a cost avoidance because the cost hasn't happened yet. But, it, but if we don't do something, the cost is going to be imposed or people are just going to be taking the market risk of losing their facilities. So I don't know. It would be interesting if, if you haven't done that, just to, what do they see over this time frame? What, that's an accrued benefit. It's a cost avoidance versus you, you've been spending it already. But, and I doubt they're going to reduce your premium any because they're going to look at the risk. But how do we account for the, the do-nothing strategy and what the, uh, the commercial underwriters will impose upon properties? Okay. And as also the movement to put more of the risk in the federal program on the individuals and subsidize that less out of the, the fund that's $53 billion in the red. Uh, it'd be interesting, I'm not now, but it'd be interesting to see that because that really is an economic benefit and really captures a little better the risk of the we can wait. Mr. Hanson. The do-nothing strategy is a guaranteed downgrading in a very long and tedious demise by Wall Street if, this, if, if we don't step up and go and take it apart to the level. Your investment, not only in this study at $4 million, but your investment in the 31 drainage areas of this city at $8 million, your investment in $12 million in modeling is the most significant investment you've ever made so that you get the data-driven decision-making information that you need to put a long-term strategy together. I totally agree with you. You're going to be able to to transfer it to the backs of the individual owners, be it residential or commercial, but eventually the weight of Wall Street to protect private investment trying to <coughs> relocate to good schools and safe communities will, will be the, their stockholders won't allow them to come to a community that waits for someone else to bail them out. So we are talking about decisions long term here about the economic vitality and continuance of our city. Well, I, I concur with that assessment, yes, which comes back to my next question. But John, I please. I went back, and I would think it would be helpful on each of what the charts and the options are to go back and show what the cost is, you know, per building and also per square mile. But if you go back and look at per capita, since most of this money would be borrowed over a certain period of time, it really does mean we will have to rethink how we segregate our debt policy. We'll need a different debt policy than we have today because all these things are at a minimum about $2,000 per capita in and of themselves and even spread over population growth. That's using 600,000 people. So we're going to have to rethink our debt strategy and how we communicate with Wall Street what that debt, additional debt is over time because it will be spread. I understand all that, but it's still going to be more than what our current debt policy accommodates with other things. So we're going to have to think about how we strategize that. And I know you're probably giving some thought because you shared before that you've been looking at this, but this is a big public discussion and we'll crowd out other investments over time. Mr. If, if you recall when Mark Johnson provided his, uh, his stormwater briefing and we presented you that 15 year, a major component of, of being able to reach 1.3 and beyond, and we actually showed you a financial analysis to 2040 based on a certain ceiling of ERU dollars and increments of tax, real estate tax, taking you to about a dollar zero seven and a quarter or something along, but a dollar zero seven. That provided you $2.2 billion by 2040. And the question that was asked by Rosemary to CJ about how long this duration is, what we're trying to tell you is you don't have to eat this animal in the next two, you know, 36 months. You got to have a long-term financing strategy. You invested a dollar in real estate in 18. You're investing. We're asking for a dollar and a half or a cent and a half, excuse me, in 18, a cent and a half in 2020's budget. You're able to get ahead of this. You're already generating the financial strategy to get there. And what will happen is, as, as Mark briefed, we'll wean ourselves off the road programs. And as the road programs get finished, the ones that you currently are all committed to, we'll come off those, all those real estate, all that capital improvement program has to go back into stormwater so that we can boost ourselves to 2.2 billion by... Um, 2040. But we are going to need 
other funding to support that, and that other funding has to be a concerted effort by state and federal investment in their Department of Defense, the, the state's investment in this region. And so there is going to have to be some cost sharing. And that is, we're not, we're not, we're not marketing that right now because they're not ready to have that discussion. We need to go forward with a, with a uh, response to what you talked about in the retreat and move forward with a long-term solution set that is affordable for the local residents. Well, the reason why I mention it, because you yes, take sir. that $2.2 billion that you just referenced, which is mostly debt, and you think we might have 600,000 people in 2040, and that's a little higher than what the folks at Charlottesville would suggest that we would have, <laughs> that would bring you to a per capita debt of $3,850 just on that. Our per, per capita debt policy is 3000 so I think even with other funding based on what we're programming for debt, we will be over our per capita debt policy. I realize when we raise revenues, that gives us an automatic percentage increase of debt service costs just because you're reducing the budget, but it doesn't change how many people you have. And so I do think there's a crossover point, maybe not during this term of council's point, but there is a crossover point. And usually when you're talking to Wall Street, it's always best to be having your strategy way before you get to the crossover point so they understand where it's coming from. But we will cross over because of slow population growth, and no one's suggesting it's going to increase. So I do think we will have issues with our per capita debt policy independent of other sources of funding. So I've showed you where, the, where these would be beneficial with the city. Why we wanted to give you two examples of uh, what changes in the way of numbers and benefit cost ratios. So I'm looking at alternative A1, which is the minimum protection just along the Chesapeake Bay, which ha if you remember had a standalone BCR of 201 and a cost of 1.13 billion. If you were to do the elevation strategy, you would actually increase your BCR to 2.09, but you increase your costs by about 300, uh, $310 million. If you look at doing the demo and re demolition and rebuild of the non-protective structures, your BCR actually decreases to 1.95 because the demo demolition and rebuild is actually more expensive than the elevating the home. And you, your cost would actually increase by the same $310 million. But if you look at the voluntary acquisition, your BCR increases to 3.77 because you get rid of all the future flood risks that you would have for having a structure there, but you, and your cost increases by... Uh, that is uh, $540 million. Is that cost to That's buy the cost. or tax? It also includes lost revenues based on elimination from the tax roll. Uh, that cost does not include the, and I'm going to get to that here in just one minute about the, the voluntary acquisition. Okay. Uh, if we look at alternative C1, which had the standalone of 1.69 and a cost of $2.42 billion, if you elevate you increase your BCR to 1.72, you increase your cost by about $70 million. If you go to the demolition rebuild, your BCR remains the same at 1.69, but your costs increase by about $100 million. If you look at doing voluntary acquisition <coughs> in combination with alternative C1, your BCR increases to 2.28, and your cost increases by about $130 million. So what does that mean to your risk? So in regards to the risk, this is what I showed you earlier regarding what your flood risk would be in the future if you implement each one of the alternatives. If you do just all the demo rebuild projects in conjunction with this, your C1 alternative drops down to $21 million from $33 million. If you look at doing the building elevation in combination with the city watt, you drop from $33 million to $18 million. Would you back up one, please? Yes, sir. So just, just so you you understand what CJ is trying to tell you. He's got these protections, but he has no protection. No, it's it's there. It's just off the end of the chart, sir. This is here? This, this, yes, sir. So, it's, the, it's down here so the wall is there. Yes, sir. Right. My error. No problem, sir. Thank you. Now, what you don't see is a chart for voluntary acquisitions, because FEMA-based analysis <laughs> doesn't worry about the fact you're going to lose tax revenue. It doesn't take that into account when you do that type of analysis. So we're going back and making sure, because if you lose $3,000 in taxes off of a structure for the next 50 years, that's an impact to what your actual benefits would be. So we want to make sure we're accounting for that, so we'll be presenting that to you the next time we come to see you. 
Uh, from a conclusion standpoint, elevating the buildings seems to be a very cost-effective strategy. The voluntary residential property acquisitions in the Southern Rivers would show a high cost benefit. And then wet, wet flood proofing, it seems to be a better alternative than dry flood proofing for non-residential buildings. Natural and nature-based features. This is what everybody talks about, at green, about green infrastructure. What I want to, first thing I want to explain about this is that <coughs> the Army Corps of Engineers does not allow you to use natural and nature-based features as a standalone flood reduction strategy. They have to be done in conjunction with some other strategy. So we are not looking at these as just if we go plant a bunch of trees in the southern rivers or we rebuild the marsh in the southern rivers, that it's going to sa save the southern rivers. It's, it's not, the Corps won't let us do it that way. So we're trying to follow how the Corps would do it because in order for us to get federal money to assist with this, Corps has to agree with us that we are doing the right thing. And FEMA won't certify it if, it, if all you're trying to use is natural nature-based features. So what are we talking about about natural and nature-based features? We we'll look at the chart here from the left to the right. This is the building level strategies we've talked about, whether you ac voluntarily acquire or you demolition and rebuild or you elevate the building. This is your structural level, your citywide, elevating your roads, putting your levees in, putting your flood walls in, putting in your pump stations and your gates as your drainage improvements. And then the nature-based features would be what would be built on the outside of your citywide structures. And those nature-based features could include beach nourishment, which we're already doing, marsh restoration creation uh, or enhancement, doing uh, increasing the amount of subaqueous <coughs> vegetation that you have in the water, which I'll talk about the friction on that here in a few minutes. Oyster reef restoration is another alternative. Some of the hybrid strategies that exist are living shorelines. Instead of building a hardened embankment, you build a ecologically friendly uh, shoreline along the area, which allows to be able to reduce the amount of uh, wave action. Living breakwaters, which you can see how rough the water is on this side. The wind's blowing from the left to the right, but you see how calm it is on this side. It helps cr decrease the amount of turbidity in the water. It also, by doing that, decreases the amount of erosion that would occur. On the, on the land. And ecologically enhanced revetments are a combination of doing some type of hardened structure and doing some type of uh, green infrastructure. So we've looked throughout the city at where these would be beneficial at. And you could see, for example, looked at doing restoring the marsh islands down here, or looking at doing the beach replenishment all the way around the outsides, doing the uh, living shorelines or uh, marsh creations up in the Lynn Haven and along the Elizabeth. And we wanted to make sure we explored those options because they do provide ecological benefits in addition to providing financial benefits in the long run. I want to remind you back to when we talked to you in January about the SLAM analysis that we did, which is what happens to the marsh as you get to three foot of sea level rise. So the picture on the left is all the marsh that's in the city of Virginia Beach at this current time. And you see how much of that marsh disappears when you get to three foot of sea level rise. And as you lose marsh, you get more water flow, which allows more water to set up in the southern parts of the city and in the Lynn Haven, and that allows the, uh, bo the boundary condition to get to a higher elevation. So we asked ourselves the question, what is the flood risk reduction potential of marsh island restorations in Back Bay and in in, in, uh, northern North Carolina? We have a map in our office from 1868 that shows the extents of the marsh islands in Back Bay back in 1868. <coughs> this picture right here shows you the marsh islands as they are today. This shows you what the marsh islands were back in 1868. What would happen if we went and restored all those islands and made them back to the condition they were in 1868 by building the island up and then spraying in the vegetation? So you get the vegetation in there that creates the friction that makes it so the water has to, cannot pass through as easily. And that cr creates that setup that we keep hearing about the wind tides causing in the southern part of the city. And we looked at this with four different scenarios. We looked at existing sea level conditions with the existing marsh islands. And then we had analyzed it with the existing conditions and if we restored the marsh island. Then we looked at what happens with the existing marsh island conditions with three foot of sea level rise. And if you restored it with three foot of sea level rise. And what we found by doing this is you end up with about one to two inches of flood reduction in, in the southern back bay area. But more importantly is if you have a 12 mile per hour wind blowing from the south, it takes about three days for that water to set up to an elevation of two in the northern bay, which is when we start hearing the calls that, hey, Muddy Creek Road is flooding. So by doing this, though, you delay that time 
that it takes to set up by about four days. So now instead of two days or three days to set up, it's six or seven days before the road starts flooding when the wind's blowing from <coughs> the south. So it does provide benefit is what we're, we're, we've been able to determine. This is from the World Bank. Uh, this is their strategies on how you approach uh, NMBF features. We've done steps one through three with the report that we have. Uh, the only difference between what the World Bank put out and what we did, step six in the World Bank is step two. We don't think we can develop a financial strategy until we, know, until we have an idea what it's going to cost. So we moved it a little further back in, in the uh, analysis. Uh, public engagement. Uh, keep hearing everybody talk about the Dewberry study. It's Dewberry's preparing the report for us. They're doing, this, they're doing the analysis for us. But this is City of Virginia Beach's uh, resiliency adaptation plan. It's not staff's. It's not Dewberry's. It belongs to the citizens. So we want the citizens' input. So we are having over the, at the end of the month, we're having five public meetings right now at the Aquarium, Kempsville, Kellum, <laughs> Princess Anne, and Creed's Elementary. Uh, and we're going to put the, the news out there. We want people to attend these meetings. We want their opinion. We want their input. We have an email address, slr-comments at vbgov.com, that people can send comments on the policy document or anything they see by watching this presentation, and we're going to answer those questions. We've got people who that goes directly to their Outlook box, so they see the question pop up. We're going to give them the answer that they're looking for. Uh, we are also sending a flyer home to every student in the city of Virginia Beach. So it goes home to their parents, and it's the flyer that you see over here on the right. Um, and, and that will let, make sure the parents know. Uh, we're going to put those same flyers up in the recreation centers. We're going to put them up in the libraries. We're going to post on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on the city websites, on everybody's next door post, uh, sites. We're going to let the news media know. Uh, we're going to send out email blasts. We want people to come to this. We want to hear what the citizens have to say. We're also, in case you aren't able to come, we're going to have an online presence where you can go look at the data on, the, on our website. You can actually answer the survey questions on our website and be able to provide your input that, that way. Our next steps, we're doing the public engagement here at the end of the month and beginning of June. Uh, from there, between there and August, we're going to finish the neighborhood protections, uh, start evaluating what hybrid alternatives make sense so that we can come up with a draft resiliency adaptation plan. Uh, which we plan to bring to you all in August to show council before we go back out to the citizens in September and show them what we've come up with and get their input again. Because again, it's their plan, it's not ours. Um, once we've incorporated that public comment, we will submit a copy of that resiliency adaptation plan to NOAA uh, to meet the requirements of the NOAA grant in November uh, so that we can make sure we meet the requirements of the grant. And then we'll go into the next phases, which will begin the feasibility assessments. Uh, do want to say one thing on the policy document. Uh, just as a reminder, this document is on our website. It's available for you all to, to review, to provide comments. Uh, it's not a prescriptive document. It's a, not a document that's got to be followed step by step. But what we do want to let council know is one of the second goal is to enhance the flood resilience to critical infrastructure and transportation systems. And that action item says to adopt the most recent findings regarding sea level rise estimates and increased rainfall provisions into the stormwater design requirements. Uh, these are the tables that we've prepared from the analysis, and I'm going to let Phil Pullen come up and speak to you all briefly about the Public Works Design Standards. Before he goes, can I ask him two questions? Sure. Yes, sir. I could please. <clears throat> I know in the CIP we have a project on Princess Anne Plaza that talks about voluntary acquisition of property and then redevelopment of the property that we buy at higher density. We'll talk about that later. But does this plan involve any acquisition of property, voluntary or otherwise, that would cause that property acquired if it wasn't used for some other purpose to be redeveloped at a higher density than what it was when it was acquired? No, sir. Our, our intention would be it, what we've done with the sea level rise analysis is voluntary acquisition would be have a easement, conservation easement put over it because you'd have to establish those benefits into the future. Uh, from an environmental standpoint. This is one for the city manager. I know we got the cost of installation, but I hope that we'll also see what the annual recurring, the life cycle cost, and that's usually part of an OMB circular to show the, so that people know it's not just buying it, there's also the cost of sustaining it. So we'll want, we'll, I think we'll want to see those numbers as well. Thank you very much. Okay, Barbara, then Jess. Going back to the, the timeline and so forth, and I know that, you know, particularly all this really heavy stuff, uh, is, is going to be coming later, not right now, uh, because we're going. We have this 15-year plan of stormwater. So 
stuff. And so most of this sea level rise, heavy whatever you called it, uh, will come after that. I think that's what's in that funding formula that y'all had given us earlier. So we're looking at like beyond 2032 to really start all of those things. But things like uh, the, the acquisitions of voluntary acquisitions of property or the nature-based things, to me, are preventive measures that we ought to be starting as soon as we can. Is that, I mean, we don't really have to wait for those things because if we do the living shorelines or those kinds of things, that would help, I think, according to this chart, prevent some of the, the other impacts. So are we going to have the ability to, to start those preventive measures early? Yes, ma'am. I mean, well, after all, you know, it's, it's an ounce of prevention. It's and and Ms. Henley, one of the things that we were going to uh, provide to council next month after we made, we we're uh, NIFWF, which is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, has a grant cycle out right now. Uh, we are going to apply for a grant in partnership with the Back Bay Wildlife Refuge to look to build a living breakwater in the Back Bay uh, as a test project to make sure that the benefits are going to be there. Uh, it would be about a three-year process to get through the NIFWF grant and get the project built, and then we would monitor it to make sure it's, it's providing the benefits. But we are pursuing those options without uh, waiting. We're going forward with those items. Yes, ma'am. Well, I really, I really think, uh, I mean, I know that, uh, as you said, the core wouldn't allow us to do only the nature-based things. But if, if we know that we're doing those nature-based things and also these other things ultimately, then it would seem to me that, that it's much smarter to, to do these cost avoidance things and that would make the ultimate perhaps uh, work better or perhaps cost less. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as we move uh, the stormwater projects forward uh, and we finish up the sea level rise study, uh, we're going to look for low-hanging fruit and see if we can't combine some of that low-hanging low fruit from the sea level rise study uh, and, and integrate them into our stormwater projects. That's, that's how I see us moving forward in the short term, where we're going to get some things done that we know we can get done now, and that's why we're applying for that grant on the, uh, the, on the shoreline. Uh, but we will integrate, uh, once we make our dis final decisions on the sea level rise work, we'll start to integrate pieces of it into our stormwater projects. Well, that was going to be my next point. You know, we're, we're allocating all of our funding to this 15-year stormwater plan, so we don't have any funding for those things. So you're mm. saying perhaps grants? Is that the way we would? We'll, we'll look, at, look at, at grants and any, any other fund source we can find. Thank you. Hey, anybody else at this time? Michael. Uh, I think Jessica. Oh, Jessica. I'll, I'll go after Michael. Oh, thank you. I know I'm very new, but there's one area of this discussion I do feel very comfortable making a comment on, and that's the public engagement piece. I noticed in the discussion that the meetings occur at schools and one at the Virginia Aquarium, and um, on a topic that's um, important as this for our city and that impacts as many people it, as it does, uh, I just want to um, encourage us to think about ways that we can meet people where they are instead of... Um, inviting them to, to join the city for the discussion. That's one area that, that, um, that I have had some success in. And um, not everyone maybe feels comfortable joining a conversation at the city level about such an important topic. So I know you're already doing that because I've seen you, for example, at different organizations and meetings giving this very presentation. Um, but I'm not sure the public knows that. So it could be community organizations, churches, um, anywhere where the public meets. I would just encourage um, all of you to think about ways that you can, um, in fact, meet people where they are and share this critical information about the city and, um, and the priorities that we all face. Yes, sir. Just a couple follow-up questions. When will the modeling be online for the public to view? Which, uh, which modeling? Because I've got... I've got two halves well, of my brain. One's the sea level rise models, the other's the stormwater models. I would hope both. 
Yes, ma'am. We, we have the uh, models complete for 20, I'm doing the number, 24 of the 31 drainage basins. Um, they, sh they, engineers who come talk to us, we can provide those to them. We're looking to put the ArcGIS online map up as soon as everything's finished in September. Okay. So people will be able to see what the results are on that map. The, will they be able to utilize the tool or will it just be results? Uh, it, it'll be the results, but it'll allow you to look at which different storm events uh, you could actually, where you would actually be able to look at, here's what the, where we would anticipate flooding to be in a 10 year event, or here's where in a hundred year event or a hundred year with three foot of sea level rise. Uh, all those scenarios are in there and it shows you what the depth of flooding that would be anticipated for each one of those. Uh, the models are actually done in um, PC Swim, which is a enhanced version EPA Swim. Um, EPA Swim is a free program, so people could grab the models and look at them. Uh, so but they, if they wanted to download that, they could then. They they okay. would what well, we what well, we requested of engineers and, and developers in particular, our own consultants, as we asked them to contact us and we will provide them a copy of the model because <coughs> we do have some. Uh, we want them to understand this model is provided you as is. Uh, it's the best information we had available to build the model at that time. Uh, that if you see something that's wrong in the model, please let us know. So it's just a little acknowledgement that I'm receiving this as is. It's for my use on this reason. And we have to, uh, you just want to make sure that they're not going out there and saying your model's wrong, but they're not sharing the information to us as why it's wrong. Gotcha. And just to follow up to what Michael said, I, I think um, we should probably look at diversifying the time that we do yeah. these public outreach. 6 to 8 p.m. is dinner time and bedtime for most people for their kids. And I think that we, we would have... I mean, I, I know with the flood stuff, we usually get a big turnout, but I think um, providing a secondary time, too, for people who maybe are making dinner and putting their kids to bed and getting ready for the next day, and I, I anticipate most of these are weekdays. The, those are, uh, yes, ma'am, they're Mondays, when, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So maybe we could throw, like, a Saturday <coughs> afternoon in there. Uh, we, <laughs> we had, anybody wants to come to work on a Saturday. We, we actually thought about that, and but we wanted to get some direction from council before we proceeded forward with scheduling a Saturday meeting. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Guy, did you have a question? I did. I, I really more of an observation. I think when I was uh, testifying before my colleagues here, uh, when I was a candidate, I mentioned without naming Mr. Bodner's uh, presentation that he'd recently made, and I continue to be enormously impressed by his uh, star power. He comes across as an, and thank you for doing this, incredibly authentic and also incredibly knowledgeable. I'm sure taking him away from his algorithms and calculations to put him in front of a camera or in front of an audience must be a difficult choice. But when, when you've got somebody like him, I hope we will take maximum advantage of him because of all the city meetings that I've been to in the last month or two, I don't think anyone has penetrated the bureaucracy and that, like Mr. Bodner has. He's just got a great way about him and a great uh, attitude. And I think he's, uh, if, he, if he is the face of our effort uh, from the public standpoint, we will be, we'll be well served. Thank you. Thank you for very those kind well words, sir. Thank you very much. Rosemary. And I just wanted to say this is probably the biggest threat that faces our city, and we really got to take it seriously. And these are huge, huge numbers, and look at these things, and it's very, it's very frightening. But the good news is we are taking it, and slowly, but we're working towards it, and and our citizens need to know that we are taking it seriously, and we're starting, starting working on it as of, and, and today, we're, every day we're going to be working towards making sure that we, we're prepared as a city for this. Yeah. John. <clears throat> I know some of these big projects start in the, th in the 2030s, but we're, we're going to need to be cognizant that the demands on the federal government just go as a topic as you go into the 2030s as Social Security exceeds its trust fund liability, its trust fund capability and goes negative, and uh, also Medicare goes negative in 2027. These are all severe, serious pressures on the Fed, and I, I would not build a strategy that banked on significant contributions from the federal government. If you're looking at the 2030 timeframes, they are going to be extremely stressed. 
by a demographic population that we just can't escape. Yeah, Aaron. I'd like to echo what uh, Councilwoman Anley said with the natural um, mitigation we can do right now and, and finding ways we things we can do right now um, that not as uh, quite such an undertaking as a seawall and things like that. But if we can start, whether that's planting, do submersive um, vegetation, or uh, you know, restoration of our marshland, we need to get on that like today and find. Um, funding for that as well. So I, I think if we, if we can do that now, we should be doing what we can do now. And also while we're looking at um, ways of funding some of the bigger projects. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, can, I concur with what uh, Aaron said. You know, we got to show some very proactive <coughs> demonstrations, you know, yesterday. Anybody else at this point? Mayor, one last chart, if you don't mind. Um, we just wanted to roll out uh, where we are with the Public Works Design Standards, which, which feed into the policy document. This is the real first document that is going to provide strength, more stringent stormwater uh, recurrent flooding standards. Um, we rolled it out online um, last Wednesday, May 1st. Um, it, uh, it's a total rewrite of the document that was first established in 1994. Um, so uh, it provides um, design standards for infrastructure in our right-of-way and significantly rewrites the stormwater management section to address those things that I have bulleted up here, uh, namely additional rainfall, 20% more rainfall, uh, requirement to address sea level rise, which uh, CJ talked about, um, adjusted tailwater elevation in your design, and many other things. So we rolled that out May 1st. 60-day comment period till July 1st. We have a public meeting with the development and engineering community scheduled for June 13th. Um, we anticipate coming back to this body to give you the results, seek your input, uh, ultimately ask for your approval of the document. Um, Mr. Hansen has suggested that we have a formal council, I mean a formal public hearing probably that night, and then maybe the next week ask for your approval. Um, so that's, that's where we are. It's online uh, right there. And... Um, we're in, we're in the midst of that. Okay, Barbara, then John. Well, that's the kind of thing we need to be doing, and, and we need to do it exactly like you're, you're saying. You know, we really need to do it yesterday, but we have to, now that we do know these things, that's the important thing, and all of these things like planning so that we, because we can do those things now and, and not be spending, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost the, ta the, the, the builders and those people who purchase those buildings but it's either do it that way or do it later in, in, uh, in, in taxes. But this is a cost avoidance kind of method. And those, I think we have to look for all of those kinds of things that we possibly can. Uh, and I really uh, appreciate you doing that. Okay, John. You know, usually when the feds issue a new regulation, they always have to go through OMB and do a fiscal analysis of what impact it's going to have on the economy, just like we do. So will we get along with the regulatory proposals, even if it comes from industry? Because I think even though we might see these are costs we have to bear, I think we should consciously understand that no regulation is free. So will we be getting an implication that this increases the per square foot cost of development by X? it reduces the amount of land when you buy by an additional 10% that you can't develop. I think we need to understand what the implication means because that changes our, not that the Shields didn't do it, but it will, in, it will change our competitive advantage relative to other communities that don't face these challenges, and we just need to understand what that does. So it's not just the regulation. We need to know how the industry tell, and they're the best people to tell us because they're the ones going to have to pass it on. But I, even if it wasn't modeled, and the sophistication isn't what FMB would be, OMB would require. We ought to really, it would be nice to hear from industry at the public hearing as well, or even maybe in a workshop with us, how this translates to their business and what it means to the economic competitiveness of Virginia Beach. I expect we're going to hear from them loud and clear. Yeah, but I'd like to hear from them outside of just coming that night. I'd like to, to hear from them in advance to understand just what it means, because in three <clears> minutes, <throat> you know, you don't get a lot of right. intellect shared which we, we experienced many times in three minutes. This is a much more, I think, substantive discussion than what that would permit. Yes. Well, June 13th is a good place to yeah, that's what I'm putting in my calendar and come on down. We've, we've, been in that, we've been in that lion's den. It will take all the, all the attention you want to come because you're right. 
this is just like the frustration of being in a neighborhood that's flooding and s suffering from that every time there's a rainstorm. The, the frustration of the builders and the way they do business and the cost per square foot and the availability of land to build. I mean, all those are transferable and nobody, nobody's to blame for the polar ice caps in, the, in Greenland melting. I mean, we just got to deal with it. Yeah, I'm with you. I just yes, think we need to consciously understand the facts. Hey, yeah, outstanding presentation, well needed, well done. <clears throat> Okie dokie. I will turn it back over to you for reconciliation. Okay, now we're going to ask the vice mayor to pass out some copies, and uh, the vice mayor will articulate uh, what we're bringing forward. All right, I'm, man, I'm going to give you all these extras here. Make sure everybody gets one before I start. There should be three more. Dave, do you need one? I got one. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor, um, over the last week or so, um, Mr. Jones and I met with the manager, and mm -hmm. we also took a lot of the information from the, the hearings and from the comments that, that members of council, council made on this. And what I'd like to do, with your permission, so I know the council members have a copy of this, but traditionally we read this so yeah. that the, the public can do it. Dave, this is going to be online soon. As soon as you go final okay. with right. the reconciliation so, letter. Okay, let, let me read this out to you just so everybody knows what it is who's watching. Um, subject FY 1920 operating budget and CIP reconciliation. Dear Mayor and City Council members, after several months of briefings with extensive discussions and listening to the public input, the various public meetings, town halls, public hearings, and on social media is recommended that the operating budget and CIP be adopted with the following adjustments. First heading is new initiatives. Add $4,511,823 for implementation of a public safety pay system expansion to address public safety pay disparities within the Sheriff's Office and further expand a workforce development plan in the Fire Department, EMS, Police Department, and Sheriff's Office, an accelerated program towards promotions for sworn non-supervisory positions is to be implemented, a program providing a salary increase of 5 percent in year three, salary increase of 10 percent in year six, and a salary increase of 5 percent in year nine. The pay disparity for sheriff deputies is to be implemented over a four-year period. Number two, add 30000 to the Department of Finance to continue the implementation of findings and recommendations resulting from the disparity study completed by the city. Item three, increase funding to both juvenile and domestic relations district court and the general district courts by a total of $120,414. A city supplement of 5% is provided to those making less than $34,000. A 3% salary supplement is provided to those making between $34,001 and $40,000. And a 1% salary supplement is provided to those making more than $40,000. These supplements should be calculated after the state provides a 3% increase for each employee. Item four, increase funding to CIP project number 2-126, Laskin Road Phase 1A VDOT in the FY 2020 Capital Improvement Program by $6 million. This is a VDOT managed project, and due to a recent bid bust, additional funding is necessary to progress to a construction contract. The project increase will be supported by an increased use of previously authorized but unallocated charter bonds in the amount of $5,700,000 and by $300,000 from the recently completed CIP 2-168 Lesnar Bridge Replacement Project. In order for this project to go forward, the CTB and VDOT must add $12 million and the project team must value engineer $8 million in savings. Number five, direct the city manager to conduct two studies. The first pertains to studying Back Bay and the potential relief cut to the ocean or other strategies which would mitigate the effects of wind-driven tidal flooding in the southern region of the city. The second study is to establish a site acquisition policy and action plan of potential future uses of those properties related to flood mitigation. Number six, accelerate full-day kindergarten in all remaining schools not under construction. There's an attached summary for that. Number seven, Move funding for historic homes and contributions to both Atlantic Wildfowl Heritage Museum and Virginia Beach Surf and Rescue Museum, also known as the Old Coast Guard Station, to the newly established Department of Cultural Affairs. Increase funding to cultural affairs for historic homes by 90000 for programming and an additional FTE to be funded 
on January 1, 2020. This results in renaming the Department of Aquariums, Historic Houses, and Museums to the Department of the Virginia Aquarium and establishing the Office of Cultural Affairs as a department. Item 8, increase funding to sister cities by 7000 to support another partnership in Virginia Beach High School's Cox High School. Additional revenues are offsetting reductions. Uh, number 9, the final General Assembly budget lowered the required standard of quality SOQ local match from the proposed governor's budget. The SOQ match is a variable used within the existing city school revenue sharing fund. As a result of this change, the city's obligation to schools is reduced by $421,977. Increased state revenue by $1,198,815 for reimbursement of constitutional officers and their employees based on the State Compensation Board's recent budget announcement. This exceeds the amount estimated in the city manager's proposed budget. Increased state aid to localities with police departments, also known as 599 funding, by $456,536. The city has revised its projection for this revenue based on the state's adopted FY 2020 budget. The Code of Virginia provides financial assistance to localities with police departments that meet or exceed certain criteria through the 599 program. Item 12. Increase interest income in the general fund by $900,000. This is a result of revised projections due to additional months of realized revenue, which are not available at the time of the initial revenue estimates. Item 13, eliminate the general fund dedicated reserve for neighborhood dredging special service districts by $340,000. When a neighborhood obtains 80% signatures in favor of SSD for dredging, the general fund loans the newly established SSD initial funding with the SSD to repay the loan over 16 years. If an SSD is established in FY 2020, the funding will be established in the FY 2021 budget. Number 14, reduce the general fund pay-as-you-go transfer to the CIP in FY 2020 by $1,441,909. Reductions in year one of the CIP will include reducing CIP 3-153, various site acquisitions 3, by $361,476 and CIP 8-402 replacement for Rudy Inlet dredge by $1,080,433. In order to fully fund CIP 8-402 replacement for Rudy Inlet dredge, $1,080,433 is added to year two of the CIP with an equal increase in general fund pay as you go financing. Capturing City Council actions and housekeeping items is the next category, item 15. Increased positions within Human Services FY 2020 budget to reflect City Council action taken on March 19, 2019. An additional full-time licensed practical nurse and a .75 part-time FTE administrative technician is added to Human Services FY 2020 operating budget. To support these positions, Human Services FY 2020 appropriations are increased by $98,620, with state revenue being increased accordingly. Number 16, convert 1.3 part-time FTEs in the police department to fund one full-time veterinary technician, a total net change of negative 0.3 FTEs. On April 2, 2019, City Council adopted an ordinance to make this change in the department's FY 2019 operating budget. However, due to the timing of that ordinance in relation to the drafting of the city manager's proposed budget, the proposed budget reflects the part-time 1.3 FTEs. This adjustment will be cost neutral in the FY 2020 operating budget. Number 17, add $77,889 and authorize an additional FTE within the Health Department's FY 2020 operating budget to support the Healthy Families Program. State revenue estimates to support this position are increased by $77,889. 18, modify the school's FY 2020 operating budget and capital improvement program to reflect adopted adjustments by the school board on April 9, 2019. <clears throat> These changes include reduction of state funding in the amount of $883,108 across all school funds due to the loss of state revenue, a reduction of local funding through the revenue sharing formula of $421,977, reduction of budgeted debt service, $2,043,114 due to a fall bond issuance instead of a spring bond issuance, increase of $244,224 in a required local grant match across all school funds for a Virginia Preschool Initiative Plus grant, and an increase to schools pay as you go transfer to the CIP by $721,541 for Project 1-179 Renovation and Replacement HVAC Phase 3. Item 19. 
modify the school CIP section to reflect the current correction to reflect the correct appropriations to date and project totals for the following CIP projects. ATDs and the total project calls for CIP 1-043 Thurgood Elementary School replacement are reduced by $2,750,000. ATDs and the total project calls for CIP 1-056 Princess Anne Middle School replacement are increased by $1 million. And ATDs and the total project calls for CIP 1-180 renovations and replacements re-roofing three are increased by $1,750,000. The proposed CIP had incorrectly displayed transfers among these projects. Real estate tax increase of 1.5 cents included within the city manager's proposed budget creates capacity within the stormwater enterprise fund by moving mosquito control, street sweeping, surface water regulatory compliance, and project management to the general fund. This funding strategy creates capacity within the stormwater enterprise fund and maximizes the use of the equivalent residential unit to support revenue bonds in the stormwater CIP. The stormwater programs moved to the general fund are identified by unique budget unit names reflect, reflecting their programmatic cost and FTEs and the 1.5 cent increase is dedicated for that purpose. 21, expansion of human services mental health program. In accordance with the amendments made to the Commonwealth of Virginia's adopted 2018-2020 biennial budget, a sum of up to $916,066 in revenue from the Commonwealth is awarded to the City of Virginia Beach for the Jail and Reentry Service Coordination Pathway Program. This funding shall support the creation of up to 12 FTEs. A memorandum of understanding is currently being drafted between the Sheriff's Office and Human Services on the implementation of this new program. The MOU was not finished in time to include within the budget. The intent is for the city manager to follow up with city council to amend the FY 2020 operating budget by appropriating the revenue and establishing the FTEs once the impending MOU is final. The details for the funding sources and the adjustments are identified on the attachments. We want to thank the public who came out to the various town hall meetings and the public hearings to offer their comments on the FY 2020 operating budget and CIP, as well as staff for their efforts to provide answers to our various questions. If you have any questions, please contact us directly. It's signed by Lewis and I. Then if you go to this next page, which looks like this, this has got um, more detail on, on all those numbers I read out. And if you have any specific questions, we can certainly go through that. Then you go to the next page, which looks like this. You see this one? Uh, this, this has a discussion on the full day kindergarten utilizing reversion funds and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I believe that's it. Is there anything we need to add, Lewis? I think that's it. Uh, okay. Dave, is there anything I left out when I uh, sir, read this? I didn't read too to fast. Okay. To questions, questions comments. John. I'll go oh, I'll Rosemary. Rosemary. Then John. So there's going to be a lot of discussion on reversion funds and using them for something other than one-time expenses and saying we've never done it before, but that's not true. We have done it before. That's correct. Mm -hmm. We have done it before. And it's been a while, but I, and we use them for teacher salaries. That is correct. Um, early yep. on in my council career. 2003. Thank you. I didn't know what year it was. 2003. The council historian. <laughs> You're welcome. And it, it was actually something that I that I asked for. There was I asked to implement moving up a an advancement on teacher salaries as opposed to 2003. So we have utilized reversion funds for something other than one time expenses, and it was for teacher salaries. So we have done it before, and it was with the bless. It's, the school board can't do it on its own. But when it's with the blessings of the council, it is allowed. So those people who think you can't do it, you can. So just want that to be clear. Yep, thank you. John. Well, first I'd like to start off with a comment on the subject matter which Council Member Wilson started to talk about. I do believe that because of the how they have consistently, remember they said their average salary was $75,000 that they budgeted on. But yet their average salary before benefits this year was fifty four thousand. <coughs> if you take their benefit, their they are consciously and they are over budgeting their salaries in their budget relative to their experience, even with benefits. So I do believe there is recurring revenues within that line. And you may recall they estimated to under execute civilian their labor costs by seventeen to nineteen million dollars this year. 
So while we think of that as reversion funding, and it is, I believe within that reversion number, there is a recurring source of revenue because their labor cost curve has shifted to the left. So I think we have done it. I think this is a time that we should do it. So I think this has been a good uh, resolution of that issue. So applaud that. I'd like to come back. and It'll take me some time to look through all the spreadsheets, so I'm going to do all this today because this is the cross-reference. But on line item one of the letter, and I'm looking at the spreadsheet, in the city manager's budget, I think it was 5.1 or 5.3 million in the executive summary that he had set aside for the compensation for the pay plan he was recommending. So when I'm trying to understand general fund, I think this is in lieu of that recommendation. Am I correct? I don't believe so, but Mr. Or is Bradley? this on top of the five point for a total of nine something? That's what I'm trying to understand. So, so you're talking about the attrition fund in Mr. Moss? In his yes, in his budget for the plan that the city manager had recommended, he was using the lapse rate. That's correct. It was five point one or five point three. Five point one. Yeah. Five point one million. Five. Yep. So, is this in addition to that no, amount? This or is, in, this, or in is lieu of? this is supported by the revenue that's in, on this spreadsheet, as well as some appropriation reductions as well. So, I guess what I'm asking. So then. We are so we are still budgeting then all the positions at 100 percent based on this budget. Is that correct? We're well, we had we. Yes, we are, but we are trading that that salary account 5.145. Okay. No, this okay. additional funds in line one that are shown on this have the equivalent bill payers shown throughout in the in the revenue columns. Could we? Can I just get a cross that? reference? So, because when you look at this, it's not clear where that. 4.5. So the so where does so where is the did the 5.1 5.14 million dollars that was in your recommended budget where is that since it's not being used for this purpose is that increasing the ending fund balance or if the future is it going to a contingency account where is that in the new budget uh, I can I can answer that Mr. Mall so historically what we have done is we have set up a salary reserve because we wait for council to make action and then we distribute that in in the summer so when we budgeted three percent for salary re reserves or for salary increases generally in the general fund one percent is equal to four million dollars so what we did, we budgeted for 2% of the raises instead of the three, and that one, 4 million of that 5.1 is offsetting a 1% of that pay increase. The other $1.1 million is offsetting the vertical compression issue of getting supervisors to the midpoint of their range <coughs> over three years. A lot of words there. I always like to work back to base. We had a recommended budget that had $5.14 million in it to address vertical and horizontal compression relative to the manager's recommendation, which we are not adopting. We're, ad we're adopting a different comp public compensation proposal. So what I'm trying to hear, are you telling me is that we're we're implementing what the manager recommended, and after we implement that, we are then adopting and putting on top of that the pay proposal, which I believe we, I'm trying to understand the sequence of events, because I want to know ultimately where the $5.14 million is. As okay, you say, you're self-paying for that. Let me, let me explain. The 1%, the top, the, the final, 1% of the 3% pay raise is the first increment of the 5.14. That is the equivalent of? $4 million. Add to that a million one fifty one forty one point five. okay? That is for the promotions of our first-line supervisors to the midpoint in year three, 10% in the first year, 50% of the remaining amount to get to mid midpoint in the second year and third in the third uh, The third year is the second half of that promotion. That is a separate program Right entirely different and it goes across the entire city for supervisors <coughs> Who get promoted to the to a new job of oversight to get to mid-year by year midpoint by year three a second 
program is working in the 4.5 million that you see here. Well, you actually have two programs in the 4.5. First is professional development program for public safety. Testing at year three, testing at year six, and testing at year nine to be uh, receive a 5%, a 10%, and a 5%. Item number two in that 4.5 is resolving the pay disparity between police officers and sheriff's deputies. Right. So what I'm trying to so if I go back and look, which I will look through my own forensic accounting, but when I go back and do that accounting look and go back and look at the executive summary and follow it through in the operating budget, is the scope and purposes and the audit trail for the five point one four million dollars as you <coughs> recommended it the same execution and the same scope and the same line item expenditures that are in what's now being proposed in reconciliation. Correct. Yeah. But it's not in this. It is, this is, it is paying for that. something that is already in well, that's, the proposed right. so budget. We, so we, we found another $4.5 million, which you're going to show me of all these line items, which of those things go into it, because these yes, things sir. are kind of aggregated up. I'd appreciate that. That keeps me from having to do that. Yes, sir. Um, now, when I come back and I look at this item four, this is under capital project changes. Now, when you look at the narrative of the letter, it says we're exercising un previously unissued but authorized charter bonds, which obviously we haven't used for flooding, surprise, surprise. But that, that aside, so that's showing up as revenue, but it's debt. So that means we don't plan to issue the bonds during this budget. Sometimes we'll be issuing a subsequent budget, so there's no interest expense in this budget. So it's, in terms of revenue we need to collect, it's neutral. Is that Correct. a fair assessment? It, what we're showing is the funding source and the CIP, but you're right. Usually there's a, you know, be the following year spring when you'd be so selling. So there's an out-year interest expense that we will have to That's cover. correct. Okay, just making sure I got that correct. So when I look at the shifting on line 14, we're moving the money... Oh, that's in there. I don't know if that's pay-as-you-go money or borrowed money. Yes, sir, it is. Pay-as-you-go pay pay for a dredge. So, so, you're gonna, so now that is now freeing up the dollars that you're using. So we're using that one-time money to meet this 4.5. Is that correct? Is, I is it going towards that 4.5 level ability? Yes. So, okay. so all those sources are what's creating that. But the reason why I'm asking, because generally this body... When, certainly it's the standard I've been held to with my alternative budgets, is not to use one-time money for recurring expense. So I think it's not unfair to ask how much liability that we've used one time are we carrying over to next year's budget as a must-pay bill because this money is one-time money. So how much of the adjustments being made and revenues being moved are creating a liability that's one of our after interest expense, of course, represents a must. I'd like to get that because that's not in this letter. So to interpret what you say, Mr. Moss, you're asking for years two and three. Just to remember, the lion's share of these kind of decisions that you're making have to reach down into the 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 promotees that are in the second year, they have to reach down into the master police officers that are in year six, seven, and eight. And there's a lot, it is I'm a significantly to, less number in the out years. Guess, but this yes, particular sir. base number is an expense we create in this year that has to be replaced with recurring next year. So that's, to the extent that that's one-time revenues, and that's not this incremental <coughs> thing, that's a number in whole that has to be replaced with recurring revenues because we've already would have incurred the payroll obligation, correct? Correct. I'm just asking what that number is. Yes, sir. It represents a bill for the future. Yes, sir. And this consciously doesn't recognize that. Um, and on all these items where it says like, four, and this is under item on the letter, it says pay as you go, pay as you go. Can we, obviously you have to go in and find those where that is, can we get the what section you're getting that pay go? Because in the in the CIP or if it's in the operating budget, can we get the yeah, page number? It's roadways it? and buildings, but we can give it to yep. you. Yep, and also that goes back to uh, items 14 and 14 on this letter. I think it would be helpful if you put the project number on there so when people are going to look, it just says. We have it below, Mr. Mr. Yeah, Mall. But it would be nice if it's right there when you're looking at right it. Right at the top part, too. Okay. Yeah, I just say right when you're looking, it says CIP funding Rudy Inlet on this page. It doesn't have the project number. It keeps people from having to pull it back. It's just ease of use. I'm just saying it's at the bottom of that right, page, too. Yeah, I know, but it's just nice when you're looking at stuff. It's, sure. you know, who likes to hunt? 
I don't. And the public certainly doesn't understand all that. It would be good to see that. But that's uh, all my questions I had at this time. Just, just having gotten have not a lot of chance to study it, of course. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Henley. Um, and then to bring mm -hmm. Of course, I've been uh, talking a lot throughout the whole process about the uh, situation down in the southern watersheds with the wind tides. And this item five is extremely important because, <coughs> you know, with all this talk that we've been doing earlier today, about sea level rise um, that's in the future. This wind tide flooding is here now. And, um, but there's nothing to address that in this 15 year stormwater plan because it's not stormwater, it's tide water. And, but we can't wait beyond this 15 years to start to address this. Um, because it's already occurring and it's it's just not something that folks can, I think, be expected to just put up with. So this talks about doing two studies, uh, looking at trying to find some solution. And that that's good, I appreciate that, but it, this doesn't have any money connected with it. And I know something like that's gonna cost some money. And so I would really like to see this more carefully specified as to just what it will entail and uh, how it's going to be funded. And I assume the second study for a, a site acquisition policy uh, maybe uh, addresses what I've been talking about with open space, uh, but I hope that this will also address uh, being able to acquire uh, properties, uh, as we talked about today, that, um, you know, I know I had a lady just ask me two days ago, do I invest all this money that I'm going to have to invest to rebuild my home because of the flooding, or is it just something I should not do because of the cost that's going to keep flooding? Because there are properties down there that are flooding with this wind tide, and you know, if there were people who would voluntarily want to have the acquisition now, I would hope that that would be possible. So. The second study, just what would that involve? Is that would that include the open space possibilities as, as green infrastructure and so forth? But I noticed when we are taking away um, money from a CIP, one of them that we're taking money away from is the site acquisition money. And, and so, but I, I, I really would like to have this item five more clearly uh, written to mean something <coughs> that, that we can count on. Um, and I, I, I don't know the extent, but from some of the discussion that I heard uh, here yesterday, these kinds of studies cost a lot of money. It's not something you just up and do uh, without some, some real definition. Mr. Hanson. I would uh, commit to you, Ms. Henley, that uh, scoping of a study uh, in response to your request, we're, we're, we'd be pleased to sit down for the next, you know, seven days to try to craft out a scope for a study that we're just getting our arms around. But I, but I think the commitment to, to get that scope um, refined to meet the council, you as the Southern Watershed uh, Council lady and the other members that have districts uh, that have neighborhoods that are flooding in, in their respective areas, uh, we will work diligently to, to scope those to meet those requirements. Um, that second study is really at uh, Jessica's question about how, how are you gonna go acquire? What, what are the rules you want to apply, city council? What, what's the cost benefit ratio that's necessary to do that? Um, uh, there are certain people that, that uh, you know, what cost share should we pursue? Because there are grant funds from FEMA that will allow you to acquire, but you, cannot, you can't redevelop that, that property. We have to investigate whether FEMA is going to let us use it for stormwater containment and we can modify the ground, et cetera. Because if we can't modify the ground for, for capacity, we may not want to do it, as Jim mentioned in his conversation. So I will work diligently with you as, as we met with you yesterday and gave you a pre-brief. We will continue to put great energy um, to the point where you heard me direct the director of public works to assign a southern watershed uh, engineer to be that 
that engineer of subject matter experts so that we have one person who understands where all those issues are and we, we de-conflict the issues. But you ask us to give you a response to a lady whose location we're unaware of. We haven't decided where we're going to build levees and, and how we're going to build levees and who's going to be on the right side of the levee and who's going to be on the wrong side of the levee. But you have heard me talk about my times of being assigned to the Corps of Engineers in Louisiana. And there are those that will live on the right side of the levee, and there are those that will live on the left side of the levee. And depending on which way the water flows, it'll determine what the elevation of your first floor needs to be in regards to the amount of infrastructure that the city can provide to keep water away or whether you need to protect yourself by getting above the floodplain. And those are decisions that we have to make that I can't tell you that we ought to be investing in right now for that lady to make those decisions. Right. So, th But those kinds of investigations from this funding that I see won't be done until after 2032. I mean, that's a long time for folks to have to wonder. No, ma'am. We, we, are, we are working. Today's briefing is the acceleration of information to this body to become... Uh, knowledgeable of what the future brings. We're coming to a culmination of the, of the science portion of what sea level rise, what the projections of those new precipitation amounts are going to have. We've modeled the capacity of our BMPs <coughs> and our pipes, and we know what we have to build, and that decision is coming. And so uh, you're going to be asked by the end of this year, in preparation for us moving into our next budget cycle and the cycles after that, to, to make those large muscle moves about where we are going to elevate roads and turn them into levees and build the pump stations to burn pond and pump and be able to cast water from inside to the outside and protect outside water from coming inside. And, and those things are going to happen in the next year, and, and I, I know there's an impatience on those that are now being made aware of all this science, and as those maps show, as those visuals start to show who is at risk based on what storm, there is, there is a lot of anxiety amongst those that uh, live here in the city. And we are working rapidly towards giving you that, that resolution and that fidelity in order to make those decisions. And those decisions will accompany both operations and maintenance efforts uh, to, to build small uh, tide gates in the southern watershed and various canals, and that will relieve certain neighborhoods. And when you bring the neighborhoods and you have an enclave of 15 houses that are down in the, wa in the southern watershed, we're going to look at those and say, in order to protect these 15 houses, you got to block this ditch and you got to block that ditch and you got to have a small pump just in case it rains real hard in the center. And those are the, we're going to give you those solutions, Ms. Henley, in a, in, within 24 months, you're going to scratch that itch. Yes, ma'am. I just look and I, it seems to me that we're allocating the money now and I just wonder what's going to be left but I guess that's the next tax increase. But uh, I, I just want to be clear on all of that. Okay, just a couple of other points I just wanted to reiterate that I've mentioned throughout the time. Um, I did ask that we do an audit during this year of the Sandbridge SSD and TIF to be able to look at those for next year. Um, and, and I also had asked about the ambulance coverage in the county, and I did get a response, but I would like to pursue this. Uh, with the people down there to make certain folks are comfortable and so forth. Um, I also ask, uh, in this historical uh, reallocation, and I certainly think it's a good idea to move these things to the cultural departments, but does that $90,000 include restoring the funding that's being cut from DeWitt and the Life Saving Museum? No, it, it did not include that. It did not include that because... You know, it's kind of tough when we fund only three houses and the other other historic houses. Cog funds, and I don't know why they did that. Uh -huh. yeah, well, we're not supposed to supplement the cog it, funds. You know, when we're asking volunteers to do all of this work, 
uh, and, and we keep cutting their money every year. Uh, that's not something I think is good. And we also are, I guess, delaying this dredge into next year's budget. We have a, a very good, uh, a very persistent uh, citizen who keeps asking us every budget year to look at reinstituting a, a boat tax. Uh, I hope as we are looking at uh, changing this uh, uh, dredge cost in the next year of CIP that we might want to relook at at that issue. I think there are uh, things that, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like uh, having the, the, the people who use the service pay for the service. It's kind of like the SSD if we were to, to go back to that. So maybe in this next year's budget when you're looking at funding that in the CIP, you might want to relook at and thus reconsider uh, that tax. Thank you. Okay. John, then Jess. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jess, because I already asked a set of questions. Mine, mine's got some Sabrina. I'm sorry, Sabrina. Mine's pretty brief anyway. For this pay compression component, because i got to tell you, after you talking and Dave talking, I'm actually a little more confused as to what this is. So when we get our packet on Friday, if we can have, I don't know, something that really shows us what what is being proposed clearly with all the line items, I would appreciate it, and something that's... Maybe a little more palatable to the public versus just a block of text. That's it. Okay. John, if you don't mind, Sabrina. I was going to defer to somebody who hadn't asked a question. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I wanted to, I'm, I'm glad to see a lot of the new initiatives added here. I have a question about um, one of the items and then request for um, a couple other things. Um, Number two, glad to see the $30,000 added in for the disparity study. But what I understand is that amount is being used for more consulting and monitoring um, our continued uh, progress with um, SWAM business owners. But I would like to see more of the funding used to have that staff member in the office to as, as was indicated in the initiatives from the study. Would like to see if we could add more money in for that position because I think that would actually make an impact, more of an impact, and one that um, we're looking for uh, to help with the disparity. Uh, number three, I have a question. Um, I see that there is a 5% increase here for clerks uh, who make less than 34000 so they get a 5%, and then a they get another plus three percent. Yeah. Okay, okay. Actually, I just wanted, they get to, just wanted to confirm that. first, and then they get five percent on top of that. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that. That's what I saw. Okay. And then the other request that I have uh, is concerning uh, is CIP thirty forty seven, and that's the landfill, uh, so the landfill phase one closure uh, in Centerville. There are a lot of competing, uh, I guess, issues over there with the landfill and then with the other entity that's there that's causing the smell. And I'd like to see that uh, particular CIP funded to kind of help with that um, because I, I know that a lot of the citizens have been complaining about it. I'd like to see something happen um, with that particular CIP. And then finally, the Summer Youth Employment Program expansion. I would like to see some of the funding. Uh, I know they asked for about $84,237. I would like to see some of the funding go to that program because, you know, I know that we say that we want our youth to, to be here. We want them to stay, but they need opportunities. Um, and to see those opportunities and to see us investing um, in them and in programs like these, I think that would make a difference. So, okay. thank you. John, then Aaron. I want to go back to this. You know, I think I've always said public safety is our number one priority. It should be the first thing that we fund. I'm concerned that we're using the equivalent of eight tenths of one percent. That's the tax increase we're carrying forward or the first claim on revenue. So, we should be conscious that we've used one time revenue for a recurring expense that eight-tenths of a one penny of tax. I think that you don't have to like all the alternative budget that we put forward, but we provided many opportunities for recurring revenue. And obviously, we were willing to make 
offsets and things in the past I proposed mm -hmm. last year that were just rejected outright, various acquisitions. I mean, I can't believe the re response I got to that, and now we're willing to take it all. So clearly, I think there are opportunities in our budget to replace. And if we think public safety is most important, you can get $3.5 million of that money on a recurring basis by giving the residents their share of the 100% of the amusement tax that now goes to the TIP fund. It's not for all from tourists. It cannot be. Statistically, that's impossible. Half of that amusement would be three and a half million bucks. That's, that's stepping up to the plate and not kicking the can down the road. There's other places, and I think we should be funding that bill with recurring revenue, and then we could take this one-time revenue to accelerate the one thing we're not addressing till FY23, which is what? We all know what it is. Ditch and canal maintenance, the number one priority, and we're not able to address that any <coughs> reduce the backlog until three years from today. So I think there's some room here, Mr. Mayor, to look at some other offsets <coughs> that don't cut vital services. Now, if we are, and I don't know to what extent, I would assume that some of those adjustments we made, so I don't know how much of that 5.14 is recurring revenues in the future. I would suspect most of it is, I would think, because you're making adjustments to the base pay line. So I guess we're adopting a, an official policy going forward that we're going to consistently budget for a lapse rate to continue that revenue stream. Is that correct? I prefer not to you do that because if we do hit a recession, it's going to it's going to complicate our ability. Okay, so to that fund. represents another bill that we you would you would prefer to fill with recurring revenue and next year's budget. Is that correct? No, I'm good for next year. I mean, it was I mean, I'm assuming this budget's pat. So I'm thinking of not not this twenty not the nineteen twenty but the twenty twenty one budget. You would have a whole equal to what the expense created out of doing all those adjustments that lapse rate is now paying, is that correct? Well, Mr. Moss, one thing I would say is when Council adopted the budget for this year, the year we're in, Council budgeted attrition money of $5.3 million. Uh, Council eliminated the automobile license, the cigarette tax, and paid for vertical and horizontal compression. So the city manager, when we started in targets in September, he wanted to replace that $5.3 million in the fiscal year 20 budget. We just found it too difficult, given the idea that we also wanted to provide a 3% pay increase to match what the state right. was doing. Well, then I think my answer is we really do have another bill we're carrying forward into the 2021 budget that you need, you need recurring revenue for. Yeah. Sir. Just, just as we faced uh, a deficit at the start of our budget process of the 5.4 that we uh, used to fund our ongoing budget, uh, we, we went into that at a uh, revenue projection of an additional $2 million. We were somewhere in that 2 to $9 million shortfall. We deck. We, we gave targets of 1% cut across all the board, and of course that's tough to do when you're pretty, when the fat's already been cut out as a resort, as a result of the recession, you really didn't build back in. You're, you're growing, you're growing in your infrastructure and your sustainment costs, you're growing in your infrastructure footprint. Uh, the growth that we have in most of the city is to meet those new requirements, to meet those new demands for service of our constituency, and it's also to uh, to try to posture us as a progressive city to do things better and to be reactive to what people are looking for to relocate. So I will carry this forward as a deficit, the 5.14. I will carry that forward and start my budget $5 million in the hole. I hope that we grow. I hope that uh, we are able to uh, find cost savings. Uh, but as long as we use this process of attrition, it restricts the ability, um, uh, it reduces the amount of carryover that we have and reduces the amount of tolerance I have to withstand emergency Cost during the year. I agree, but no more than the stress and the lack of no emergency that 70% of our families have. Right. So it's uh, not more stressful, but I just, but I do appreciate now I know it is a structural yes, deficit we're carrying <clears throat> forward. Yes, sir. And that's about nine tenths of a penny, a little bit more than that's 0.9 something. I'm just trying to think of cumulatively what we're carrying forward, and all council members always have initiatives they want to do in the next year, but we are 
in this budget, we are already putting liens against what we anticipate the revenue growth would be of must pay bills. And I think to the extent that we make the hard decisions today, <coughs> we have flexibility next year versus being in a box from the start. And so the hard choices never get easier. I would just ask people to look at some of the suggestions that we had. I didn't think they were some of those things you could also look at as things to pay this on a recurring basis this year would be much smarter in my personal opinion. And that's just think because and the two things that I know uh, Miss Wilson mentioned about the lockbox. And is Dana here? There he is. I'm going to ask Dana because I did draft something. I'm going to ask him to send that out on Friday's packet. I do think that could be amended to anything we have is how we would put a lockbox ordinance wise on our budget dealing with stormwater management section. And I, I did work on something, but it's just <coughs> a rough and all improvements are, are highly solicited. And the other thing I mentioned, which I have, and I'll ask him to include that package as well because I think it's budgetary neutral, uh, is to go to over a phased period of time. I said three years, one week to get up to the six weeks of family leave. I know that's something we've all talked about here. Wouldn't do it all at once because that's kind of stressful. But but I think but I, I want to offer that up as something and maybe we it doesn't make it this year, but I like that that'll be on the docket on the on the fourteenth is that policy change. Implement over a three year period, one week a year, and certainly we'll look forward to the, the manager's report and maybe that's a bridge too far and I accept that too, but then we need to figure out when does the bridge come close enough? <laughs> Maybe and I'm open to that too, but it's something we've talked about. And the last point, which I thought at the retreat, building up on Council Member Jessica's point, <coughs> I thought there was a basic agreement that referendum was the right way. I thought that was the consensus. Matter of fact, I think it was unanimous that a referendum was the way to go about flooding. It's the only way we could raise and get the public partnership and I agree with Barbara we need time to get the information out but November of 2020 gives us time for that then we wouldn't be authorizing these tax increases out in the out year yet we would make them conditioned upon the approval and we would be we could be doing more not less and certainly we know we, we can accelerate because the engineering work can be done I still think referendum is the right way to finance this debt versus doing it via ECU fees, and let's just put it all on the real estate tax, and let's, I just think that that's what we thought we said at the retreat, and I don't think that changes anything about the current year budget allocation, but when we talk about the CIP, it does make a difference that we're really banking on a referendum vice this approach, and then we have more revenues. I think we talked about $400 million. I think that was a number we talked about a lot. I think that should set the stage. And then uh, there wasn't a lot of money in the second year either, but I remember there wasn't a lot of money in that year two of this budget in the CIP, but we could pull stuff forward, take a gap in 21, because the bond reference would pass in 20, so you couldn't start moving the revenues to the following budget year. But, I, but we could still accelerate our expenditures and the projects we could push. And the reason why I mention this, because I've seen this in my own professional work, when you increase the scale of work you can do, you don't re repetitively pay for these mobilization and demobilization costs. A person can come into your city knowing he's got five, six, seven, eight years of work. You get stabilized workforce. Your learning curve goes up. You get productivity. And in the end, you, you better execute and you lower these costs. And demobilization and mobilization costs for drainage projects are extremely expensive. And you're not getting your money's worth. So I think we've got to change our acquisition strategy and a bond referendum, Mr. Mayor, would give us an opportunity to have that sizable number of projects that you could commit and deal with on a large scale, even with our set-asides, and make a financial commitment that you could make to a, a builder or a construction firm and get those economy of scales and get more for less. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, it, we're running a little short. If we can uh, quick succinct, question. quick, and then uh, Rosemary, then oh, Jess. I, I just wanted to ask Mark if we're going to have the appropriate wording that the one and a half cents for the dedicated revenue stream lockbox will be appropriate so that that one and a half cents will be. So there's a proposal that Mr. Moss has crafted that uh, addresses both the dedication but also addresses the out years of your CIP. It's possible that's palatable to the body. We can also do just the standard dedication language that you see from the tip and the tap, which is a little less prescriptive than what's on the table. So. 
I will include both in your Friday package. I just want to make sure that it's adequate that it's going to. Okay. Jeff? I just had a quick follow up question to John's point. With the bond referendum, when would we need to take action to get that on the ballot? Next year. 20? Yeah, next year. <laughs> I mean, what? I mean, could it be. June, Does July of next be, year would be the Can it be right that late? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. That's what I was. It's like three, it's a little less than three months, I think. In All right, Aaron. I would just like to find um, in the budget somewhere where we, with everything's going on in the Beach District, and there's so much development and everything going on, that we don't lose the significant value of, of historic CTEC. I know we talked about this when we had some planning items come up that was very contentious, but whether that be historical <coughs> markers placed around the CTEC so we, we don't lose that value there, and the expansion of CTEC Park where extra parking is. It's a beautiful park, but maybe you only can fit four cars, so if that parking, so I'd like to see that somewhere in the budget. Not a problem. Okay, but listen, thank you all very much. I know uh, budgets in tough times get contentious at time, but I appreciate all the input from council, the public, and everything. But be assured going forward, we're going to have good discussions on a lot of these things. We have it, finally have the team intact right now, and then moving forward, all these idea, uh, you know, discussions about bonds and everything. You know, we will be deliberative and move forward. Okay, uh, we, we got to get to close, but uh, council liaison, any uh, quick you know, report? Just quick, I think everyone knows that Addy resigned a couple weeks ago, and they're meeting, they have a temporary person acting, so at the conclusion of the audit, we will be working on the long-term, let's get solvent plan. Okay, thank you. Aaron and then Jess. Um, the NBC uh, Minority Business Council, they want to, I know you had to replace Shannon Kane. They want to be able to recommend someone, and they, they have recommended, hopefully, Lewis. Um, so that's yeah, that, you know, that, that would be an appointment. I'm sorry. Yeah. I missed what you said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll hold that for appointments. Jess? Um, <laughs> tomorrow at 3 p.m., um, Ferry Point Park is having the ribbon cutting. That was a piece of land that was acquired by Elizabeth River. Foundation. It was a severe repetitive loss property, um, and it's now being converted to a really beautiful park. I'm very excited about it. Um, it was something we gave money to my first year on council, so if anybody wants to join us, it's going to be really good. I'm really excited. Thank, Thank you. Council comments at all? Rosemary and then Barbara. Oh, we had our crush cancer event on Sunday, and probably 500 people came out, and we... We're really close to raising three hundred thousand oh, dollars, which job. is really exciting for rare cancer research, and yeah. it was really, Multiple really kudos. phenomenal. Kudos really phenomenal. upon kudos. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, this actually is a comment on an item on the agenda. It's the one uh, ordinance. Uh, we're we're going to do the agenda. Well, I was going to <clears throat> do this so we could just not have to say anything at that point. It's, it's just sort of, it has to do with uh, our cost, the, the cost of these um, primary elections being from local money, $328,000, and that just sticks in my craw something terribly. Um, and I would think, and maybe this is something we should have to put in our legislative package or something, since the local government has to fund this and the taxpayers are funding this, not the parties, why can't we allow people to vote in all for both parties? Why did they have to go and say, I'm only voting for the Democrat or I'm only voting for the Republican? I mean, since the, 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 the taxpayers are paying for this, they ought to be able to vote for all of it. Is there anything that legally uh, would, would keep us from having to do that, especially since it's locally funded? Um, <laughs> look at it. That's huh? a very good question. Very good question. We don't have any all right, I'll just close with a quick comment. This is our first formal meeting since uh, something in the water, and I just want to thank so many people. This was a total team effort that involved hundreds, if not thousands of people just in preparation, and I really think uh, thankful that it put our city in a great light. But I just want to say to all the people that were involved, thank you and kudos. Okay, agenda review. Okay, uh, under ordinances and resolutions, does anybody have any comments? There's no speakers on any of these items. Uh, the only comment I had was on the public hearing piece, just to remind the city manager that I asked the city real estate assessor to do a comprehensive look 
of all the, ass the assessments of properties, and I think they were, and did we have an appraisal? Because I thought that $244,000, $240,000, that was a low ball number for that I property on Bunny Road. What? Is this, the, is this the buy row property? Yes. I asked for them to get an appraisal. Okay, I didn't. I had not heard that. And I, there. Okay. But thank you. I just want to make sure we get it before we vote. Yes, we're on appraisal. I did. I asked for okay, them very to good. get an appraisal. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay. Okay. Other items. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Under planning, just browsing LLC SUSU Developers LLP conditional use permit regarding a tattoo parlor, 1612 Laskin Road, District 5, Lynn Haven. I'm fine with that one. Uh, item two, Donna and Robert German, uh, German Living Trust for conditional use for Ray Family Daycare Home, 212 Upperville Road, District 2, Kempsville. That's fine. That's him. Ramada Hoffler Tower 4 LLC for conditional use permit, Ray Private College University, 222 Central Park Avenue, Bayside District. Fine. Verde um, <laughs> Salon and Spa LLC, Lake Gym D1 LLC for conditional use permit. Ray Tattoo Parlor, 2137 Upton Drive, Princess Anne. I've heard no issues. Amy Turner, Star Real Estate, LLC. Conditional use, Ray Tattoo Parlor, 4604 Pembroke Lake Circle, Bayside. Fine. Bill Kellum, VBK Properties, LLC. Assembly use, open air market, 2384 Princess Anne Road, District 7, Princess Anne. They've asked for a two-week deferral, so that would be May. May 21st. May 21st. Is that okay with you, Ms. Henley? That's fine. Okay, that's it. Okay, the chair. On okay, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into closed session for two <laughs> pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by Section Two Point Two Thirty Seven Eleven A Code of Virginia as amended for the following purposes: legal matters, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding to specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pursuant to Section 2.2-37A7, uh, Nygaard VEC claim. Personnel matters, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, disciplining or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body Pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A1, Council appointees, uh, Council boards, commissions, committees, author, uh, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Call the roll, please. Mr. Jones? Aye. Ms. Henley? Aye. Mr. Moss? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Aye. Mr. Rouse? Aye. Mr. Berlucci? Aye. Mr. Towers? Aye. Ms. Wooten? Aye. 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 Aye